basement here, and the kids are so excited to be a part of this, uh, this place. And uh, I know that the dinner was well received. We served almost 100 people, and uh, the proceeds from that dinner are split between uh, the Spirit uh, uh, Preschool and Kenwood. We earned about $1,800, so uh, what a great uh, experience for us. Then don't forget, on Wednesday we have our Lenten series continues, and uh, this week we have a guest speaker who is Pastor Craig Carlson, and we're looking forward to spending some time uh, with Pastor Craig as well uh, this week. At this time, I invite you to join in our uh, confession and forgiveness as we begin our worship service. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close to Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy, and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined, and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus, as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven. And God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. We continue with our gathering song.
uh, I give them all the credit in the world for uh, trying to do in a small group what we would uh, be singing out loud as a congregation. Uh, thank you very much for your efforts today. At this time, I invite you, we're going to gather uh, in our opening uh, uh, liturgy, and uh, so let us begin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your beloved Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, again, good morning. Good to be with you. Our first reading for today is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and 15 and 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and said to, to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you, throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Here is the reading of the first lesson. The psalm for today is Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31. For the fear of the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise or abhor the poor in their poverty, neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. 
They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, the Lord has acted. The second lesson for today is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God and whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake only, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Here is the reading of the second lesson. I invite you, as you are able, to rise for the gospel lesson for today. The uh, Lenten um, uh, acclamation is, Let your steadfast love come to us, O Lord. Save us as you promised. You, we will trust your word. The gospel today is the gospel according to Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders. The chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But turning, he looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone can become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You see that? Well, for the sake of our young listeners and viewers this morning, I wanted to share a little message. I'm going to use the baptismal font to help make that message. I'm just wondering how many of you kids out there um, uh, have had promises that have been made to you that have been broken. And now I know I can't hear you saying, yeah, I, I have. I'm sure my grandkids are raising their hand. Yep, yep, that's, that's happened. Uh, I also realize that I have probably been uh, uh, one of those who broke the promises to uh, the grandkids. 
kids. So uh, that doesn't work so well. And the question is, how does that feel? Of course, it doesn't feel well at all, does it? It doesn't feel good whatsoever. And as adults, we have people who make promises to us, and sometimes then uh, those promises don't get fulfilled. And then that sense of betrayal that happens around that is pretty real. Uh, that sense of betrayal that happens between people who we are supposed to love and who are supposed to love us. But even if it's someone who we don't necessarily know, promises are made. And when they're kept, that's great. And when they're not, that becomes a problem. What I want the kids uh, to remember, I want you to remember out there, kids, is that there is someone who makes promises to you and who always fulfills those promises. And that is so important. I think that's the piece of uh, our faith that is critical and crucial. That God makes promises to us and fulfills his promises. Uh, the promise uh, also takes on in the, the Christian church a very important uh, thing, and that is the sacrament of holy baptism. God makes promises to us in baptism. He promises that he will call us by his name. We receive the name of Christ. We are baptized into the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so we hear that promise that not only do we, that we die when we die this physical life, we die in Christ. And spiritually, we die to self and rise in Christ. And so the promise is that resurrection promise. And that happens. God is faithful to his word. And that's where our faith comes from. Our faith is not in ourselves. Our faith is in the one who is able and willing and consistently fulfills his promises. And that's why I believe, because of the promise that God makes to, to me in Holy Baptism. So I want to remember that, that your faith is somehow uh, secure in the promise that God makes you. It's not about you. It's about God's faithfulness, and it's secure there. That's a place where it can be held and not have to worry about it. So that's an important piece for us today. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, may God's grace and peace fill our hearts and keep us in Christ Jesus. Amen. So I want to begin this morning uh, by looking at the Old Testament lesson for today. Uh, it's the story of Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarai, and uh, we know already from the text that uh, they get renamed. We're going to look at what that means and why that's so important. Now we have probably read this story a few times from our youth and then uh, probably as adults as well. It's a text that comes up again and again because it's one of those covenant uh, texts. Uh, God makes a covenant with Noah, right? I will never again destroy the earth. That's last week. The rainbow is the security of that. God makes a covenant now with Abraham and Sarah. And that is that they are going to be the parents, right, of many nations. And God is going to bless them. Abraham is known as a person of faith, a person through whom all nations of the world will be blessed. But their story is very intriguing, isn't it? Since neither of them uh, somehow know exactly what, how this is going to happen because uh, we know pretty much from the text that these two are not what we would call spring chickens. Uh, Abraham is 99 and Sarah has long since stopped uh, being a person who is uh, able to bear children. So we have these non-spring chickens who have been given this promise that God will make of them this great nation. Then a child will be given to them, and that will be the beginning of these many nations of blessed people. Now we read today's text, and we hear God promise, I will make my covenant between me and you. I will make it exceeding, and make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abraham <clears throat> falls on his face, and God renames Abram, Abraham. And what we didn't always take notice of is that God also makes a covenant with Sarai. And she also is renamed, uh, not Sarai anymore, but Sarah. God further says, I will bless her and give her and Abraham a son. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. And kings of peoples shall come from her. 
This is not the end of their story. You may remember this pregnancy did not happen so quickly or easily. As time passed, both Abraham and Sarah became impatient. Wow, has that ever happened to you before? Where you have the expectation of particular things and time passes and then it just doesn't happen. And we become impatient. And so Abraham and Sarah did what many of us have done. We decided to take matters into our own hands. Okay? So Sarah uh, is uh, upset because she's been given this promise and it's not happening as she was told. And so she decides to take matters into her own hands in her own hands, and she uh, contracts with her servant girl, Hagar, and she makes Abraham, it must be God's promise <clears throat> that this is not happening through me, but I will make sure that Hagar then, you go in and you have a child with Hagar, and maybe God's promise is fulfilled in Hagar. So that's what they did, took matters into their own hands. Well, we know that doesn't go well. Uh, Ishmael is born, but Abraham and Sarah think that they have now somehow uh, fulfilled God's promise. Four times God comes to Abraham and reminds him and Sarah of his promise to them. Until finally God says, my promise is that you, Sarah, <clears throat> will be the parents of many nations. He repeats his promise, and finally Sarah conceives and gives birth to Isaac. But what does the story reveal? Abraham believed God, that's true, but he also did not understand God. He did not understand God's purpose. He did not understand the promise and what it meant and the fulfillment of that, what that would do. Probably uh, <clears throat> he could conceive of no greater plan than that God was just inviting him to have many children and, and their children would have many children and he's thinking rather tribally about himself and his family and can't quite conceive of the bigger picture which is God inviting him to be the father and Sarah the mother of these many nations the nations of the world he thought that he knew what God was about to preserve his bloodlines to make sure Abraham's descendants filled the earth more importantly, God was making a promise so greater than the assurance that Abraham's bloodline would be populated the earth was the assurance that God's promises were trustworthy and sure. And that was the peace that Abraham had missed. So let's jump now to the gospel lesson for a moment today and see why these two texts are together. It's the lesson of Jesus and the disciples. Jesus is with them, and Peter has just made his great confession just last week. You are the Messiah. And we hear, he's getting praised, and I'm sure all the disciples, whoa, wow, what a great understanding Peter has. There's a deep conviction here, and Peter is somehow uh, longing that everything that he is talking about is going to be fulfilled. But what is he thinking about? What is Peter's dream about what the Messiah will bring. But then Jesus begins in our lesson to teach Peter and the disciples that the Son of Man, man must undergo great suffering, that he's going to be rejected by all the leaders, he will be killed, and after three days rise again. This news does not please Peter. In fact, he pulls Jesus aside. Hey, Jesus, over here for a minute. A little private conversation, you and me, and begins to personally rebuke Jesus. Why? Like Abraham, Peter has faith, but he has no understanding. He sees what he wants to see, and but he's blind to the will and purposes of God, which are greater than Peter can comprehend. Jesus doesn't let this take on a private uh, little uh, existence. In fact, he turns the conversation public and he rebukes Peter in front of the other disciples, making sure that they understand this is not what I'm about. I'm not about what Peter is thinking here. I'm not about this earthly kingdom. I'm not about this earthly thing Peter is proposing. I am thinking much greater than that. I must fulfill the will of the Father. 
This is a bigger picture. Peter's mind is on earthly things. His mind is on revolution. Let's start a new movement. You and me, Jesus, and the, you know, through with those other disciples, we can take care of this world. We'll turn the Roman Empire upside down. But Jesus has in mind a heavenly thing, and that is evolution. Jesus is going to transform our lives. He's going to place faith and our futures in the hands of the one whose promises are trustworthy and will not change. God's will. God's choice. And he invites us to do the same. Become my followers. Let go of these things to satisfy your own plan to save yourselves. Somehow plans that promise you everything, even life, but which always disappoint and always take life away instead of giving life. Why? Because they cannot deliver. They cannot deliver you from sin. They cannot save you from death. They are empty. They are temporary. And always depend on that which cannot be depended on. Mostly yourself. But what if I were that one God sent to fulfill his promises? What if Jesus promised to be the one to save your life? To embody God's promise and fulfill God's demands so that neither sin nor death can take your faith and trash your hope? What if? You see, Peter is drawn out of this tribal thinking mode and offered a vision of some greater truth that he is watching unfold in Jesus and it makes him wonder, which comes Good Friday and Easter morning, it transforms his life, and he is never the same again. He will see Jesus, the Christ, no longer as a revolutionary, but as a savior. The whole world, not just a few, not just the Jews and those who have come to know Jesus in this earthly life, but all the many generations yet to come, which is the same promise Abraham has given, been given. They too will understand what God is doing now, not to save the few, but to save all. Here's where this text hits us this morning. Jesus doesn't just come to save us, but all people. I am not ashamed to say this. The one who saves me is faithful. God's promise is fulfilled in Jesus. And I believe and I have faith in him. But this same faith is salvation that is promised to all. Which means I don't get to claim this for myself as some private little enterprise between Jesus and me. But I must also look around the world and see how God is moving and calling us to be witnesses to that saving power of Christ for the whole world. God's picture, God's scope is bigger than just how it affects Jeff Holton. We are all collateral gifts of life in a global and cosmic plan that God has. Enacted by God and Jesus Christ, our Lord, God moves us beyond ourselves and invites us to see his face in the many faces of his creation. Brothers and sisters, all of them, the earth and the whole creation, stars and galaxies and creatures great and small. The glory of God is everywhere and in everything. To this, the psalmist says, I will sing his praises. But his heart is not being able to join you in praising God. That's hard. Because together we give voice to what we call to be true as a people of God. That we are caught up in this wonderful plan that God has for us to be a part of his new creation in Christ. So the glory of God is everywhere and in everything. In us, yes. 
see each other, yes, as we praise the God who calls us into his glorious plan, the splendor of God's story, and it is all. At this time, I invite you to join as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in the prayers of intercession. 
intercession uh, this morning and the response to hear us, O oh God, is a silent response, but your mercy is great in this response. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Gracious God, we thank you for the grace that you give to all people. Give confident faith to us who have been baptized in Christ, that we may follow you wholeheartedly, but help us to also share the promises of this faith with those around us. Give us courage in the midst of suffering to still trust in the goodness of life and the goodness of the faithfulness that we have because of your promise and your gift of faith to us. We ask that you would bless us this morning. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. And then, gracious God, your grace is not only bestowed on us, but on the whole earth that you have created. From galaxies and microorganisms, you preserve your creation. Teach us to be humble and still in wonder of your work as we join uh, people in taking care of this, this beautiful land and the seas and skies that you have given to us. Help us to be diligent and make us responsible. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You are the ruler of the nations. Raise up advocates of peace and justice with the between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we can't even imagine. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In Jesus, you have joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal in all the depth of your love to us that your cross is something that opens us up, not just to suffering, but to also carry the burdens for those around us. Restore all who are sick and grieving. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, especially those who have been exploited and oppressed. We ask this morning, too, that you would be with those who are hurting in our congregation. Be with Jean Neely today as he is recovering in the hospital. Watch over him. Keep him safe. He so longs to have someone be close to him, and this pandemic has been so isolating for him. Be with those who are finding ways to get their shots for this pandemic. Watch over workers and those who are ministering uh, those, uh, those injections. Be with uh, people around our country who are going through difficult times, whether it be financial or otherwise. We ask that you would guide and keep us safe. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Gracious God, you made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. So bless grandparents and parents and foster parents and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip us to service uh, each other in a way to make family possible. Help us to be a congregation sensitive to those ministries. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Finally, Father, we await the day of Christ coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and our prayers to you, O faithful Father. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, I just want to remind you, uh, this is a part of our, our time where we would normally receive offerings. And uh, our offerings will be received as the exits of uh, the sanctuary today. But for those of you who are visiting us uh, electronically, uh, you will also have opportunities to uh, give, and we invite you to do so to support the ministry of our congregation. And so you're welcome to do that electronically or send your offerings in on the mail or whatever. 
uh, and thank you for your support uh, this morning. At this time, we join in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, <clears throat> Almighty and merciful God. Through our Savior Jesus Christ, you call your people to cleanse their hearts and to prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace, and so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one, let us pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward to take the elements for Holy Communion. Again, the elements will be placed on the table in the narthex, and you can receive them as you go home as you receive the body and blood. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives may bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You are what God made you to be. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, free to serve your neighbor. God bless you, that you may be a blessing in the name of the Holy One of Life, our triune God. Amen. Now then, go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God.